Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Alex Shandes and I am a second year MBA student at UCLA Anderson. As we look to the future of healthcare, exponential technologies will continue to fundamentally reshape how we interact with the world around us. On behalf of UCLA Anderson Healthcare Business Association, it's my honor to welcome our keynote speakers for a fireside discussion on how technologies like AI, blockchain, and big data processing will transform the way that we approach healthcare, making it more equitable and accessible for all. Anthem Incorporated is the provider of health insurance in the United States and is ranked 23rd on the list, Fortune 500 list. Through its family of health plans, Anthem serves more than 45 million members. In early 2017, the organization set out on a journey of digital transformation, and today they're developing a digital platform for health that will advance and enhance patient, provider, and payer experience. Rajiv Ranaki serves as the president of Digital Platforms, where he and his team are reimagining the future of healthcare by harnessing the power of data and artificial intelligence to provide customers predictive, proactive, and personalized insights into their health. In addition to his work at Anthem, Rajiv has also recently published his first book, You and AI, a Citizen's Guide to Blockchain, AI, and Puzzling Together the Future of Healthcare, which explores how exponential technologies can be integrated into a company's DNA, creating an AI-first, blockchain-first, and data-first, technology-first digital enterprise with inclusivity and 21st century, for the 21st century and beyond. Maria Filipova is a healthcare transformation catalyst, leading industry-shaping initiatives that accelerate organizations' abilities to dynamically sense, validate, and scale new solutions and disruptive business models. Maria's successes have relied upon fostering creative collaboration among established and new entrants in healthcare to develop solutions that redefine established healthcare workflows and business models to be more inclusive. And her past experience as an entrepreneur, innovation champion, and future of work expert have shaped her perspective on the, in, on the importance of transformation in closely regulated industries such as Europe and the US. Thank you both for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. That, uh, that intro itself seemed like a long book, Alex. So thanks for <laughs> patiently going through that. Of course, it's my pleasure. We're honored to have you. And we thought it would be great to start out with just a few questions and then hear all of your wisdom if you want to share between each other. And then we'll um, follow up at the end with a few more Q&A questions. Sounds great. Um, it would be great to begin with some historical context related to the reimbursement sector, which I know you both have worked in and currently work in. Um, most people think of insurance companies as commodity organizations and liaisons between doctors, patients, structure of payment. But both of you have greatly influenced the progress towards a more tech-directed approach in both health insurance and healthcare through the integration of innovation, AI, and blockchain. And we'd love if you could start by sharing with us what you see the role of a modern health insurance company playing in propelling equitable healthcare forward. Yeah, so Maria, I can start, you know, since, you know, I'm currently working for an insurance company and you were formerly <laughs> working with us. So uh, I'll tee, tee you up for, for a couple of questions there. So uh, I think that the role of insurance, I think, is, is actually changing from insurance to assurance. You know, whereas I think the the legacy view on insurance was that, yeah, we were there, we're kind of the boring company that does the, the plumbing and the nuts and bolts of the healthcare industry or any other industry for that matter, uh, to, to make sure that um, uh, people are protected in terms of an adverse financial event. You know, so whether it's fire, it's auto or it's health, you know, that, that's kind of the role that insurance has played. Uh, but what if uh, you can actually, rather than just kind of taking care of the, the downside risk, uh, be much more proactive, predictive about what might happen in the future. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, I've got a family history of heart conditions or, or diabetes or any other chronic conditions that despite my best efforts, uh, because of my, uh, you know, uh, the luck of the draw, you know, I just can't do anything, much, anything about. What if, uh, you know, Anthem could actually predict what might happen six months from now, two years from now, five years from now, and then offer constructive and, you know, easy to, to follow advice and instructions on, on what to do to stay healthy and do, do so in a manner that's not cluttered, that's not big brotherish, not 
you know, sort of at the expense of, of privacy and, and protecting my health information, but do it in a way that is, is uh, puts the consumer's interests uh, first and puts it at the heart of what we need to do, you know, in, in terms of serving our consumers and making it so that we keep people healthy uh, as opposed to just taking care of them, you know, while they're sick. So that I think is fundamentally what's, what's different about, you know, what we are uh, doing uh, now versus what we did in the past. And then, uh, you know, uniquely, I think we're uniquely qualified to do it because, you know, we, we have the, 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 the probably the widest perspective of health in the country. You know, we, we, we ensure, as you said, Alex, about 45 million lives, and that gets us insights into to lots of data about what's working and what isn't working in our healthcare you know, system, where treatments and diagnosis work better, and what's, you know, um, you know, when matched up to a personal health history, what could work best versus leaving it solely at the discretion of doctors, you know, with perhaps a more limited view of the person's, you know, health history and what might work and, you know, may not work. So that in essence is what we're trying to do and which is be, uh, use, a, use our unique position as a convener of, of lots of parts of the healthcare system to orchestrate it such that uh, consumers have a more delightful, easy to use experience and ultimately get better, better health outcomes. And through that, of course, we want to make healthcare more affordable and more equitable and make it available to more people in our country than currently have you know, access to care. Uh, Maria would love, would love your perspectives on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I love that you, I, and I'm hoping that our audience picked up on two pretty significant changes in, in the way you answered that question. Number one, um, you called that the transition from insurance to assurance. And I'm hoping you also, uh, as the audience, picked up the transition from healthcare to health. And so we're talking about health assurance rather than healthcare insurance. And that's a very significant shift. And it's, it's important because now we actually have the technology, the tools to operationalize that. Um, that's what makes this time that we live in so exciting. Um, from my perspective, as you as you mentioned, I served as a serial entrepreneur at Anthem as the uh, vice president of innovation until recently, and I currently lead um, as the CEO. I serve at a startup called XY.AI, and what we are really trying to do is make that transition to health easier and quantifiable to insurers, to providers, and to the patients as well. And so I would I would encourage. Those, those of you in the audience who have clinical background in um, for just graduating from medical school or those who are coming in with a computer science degree, these are the types of cross-functional thinkers that we need to start bridging those gaps between, well, insurance company, healthcare versus health. And I'm happy to talk to you more about what, how we define that health um, complex, uh, complexly or comprehensively. Um, but I think these are pretty big, two big, pretty significant, significant shifts that we're seeing. That's great. Thank you both. These are really insightful and helpful answers for the audience. I think one thing that we've really talked about as a country, and I think globally, is the shift in the past 24 months that we've witnessed with the unprecedented change in healthcare secondary to the global pandemic. And the rapid adoption of tech ha that's ensued and continues to remain available, a bit available to patients at home include at-home monitoring, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, in the hospital and out, and then digital health solutions. Would you be willing to share some of where you see these technologies, specifically AI and blockchain, improving equitable care in the future? I'll start. Um, so I'll start with, with uh, AI. Um, I think AI has an opportunity to um, identify the full spectrum of factors that impact health um, and help us then compute or quantify the impact of each of these factors on the health outcome, and then do something about it. Um, for me, healthcare, uh, um, AI in healthcare coupled with uh, blockchain and um, the computational power that we have today leads to, frankly, infinite, uh, very real, real possibilities. I'll give you an example. As I mentioned, literature now tells us that we only about a third of our health outcomes could be direct, directly attributed to your uh, genome, meaning the biology 
uh, factor that you have that you carry as a patient or the clinical interventions. The two thirds of the outcomes, especially in certain diseases, even more than that, are attributable, attributable to things like the built environment. Do you live in a neighborhood that has more liquor stores than green parks or more fast food restaurants than grocery stores? Things like what is the socioeconomic footprint in, in the environment in the neighborhood you live in? What environmental factors that you're exposed to? Not only UV exposure, or air quality, but noise pollution, water quality. And obviously there's the individual behavior component as well, smoking and other, um, and other factors. But when you put into, into the full, when you, take it, when you take into the account the full picture of what impacts our health, um, now we really have a better understanding of these factors and with the help of AI and the vast magnitude of data that we generate today, we're able to put some very real examples in place so that for those conditions that are highly, um, highly dependent on environmental uh, factors for their outcomes, we can do things. When you look at conditions like asthma, when you look at conditions like stroke or COPD, some cancers, the environment and your behavior are contributing uh, 44, 45% from based on what we're seeing. So I'm really hopeful and excited about being able to um, deliver what we call, what we call geo-health intelligent predictions and personalized interventions for those patients who are um, who have asthma, who have COPD, and were able to connect the dots between their care team, their clinical care team, and their environment outside in the 99% of the time when they're outside of the clinical setting. Uh, excellent points, Maria. And I agree with everything you said, you know, and I think, um, and then tying it back to the question around, you know, equity, right? So I think, um, Technology and equity are inextricably linked in, in some ways. You know, so using a, an example from a completely different you know, industry, right? So telco, you know, right you know, before uh, you know, cell phones, which probably to the, to the audience that we're speaking to here, it's hard to imagine a world without you know, cell phones uh, and mobile phones. But there was such a time where people had to, to rely on phones that were tethered to the landlines. And, you know, that the way that you got access to it was, you know, the telephone company had to go and lay cable and put copper in and, you know, connect your phones to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the network in order for you to get service. And, uh, you know, that, that meant that, yeah, some parts of the world had, you know, that access and, you know, vast majority of the world didn't have access to it. And um, just because it was hard to take on expensive infrastructure projects to go in and connect every household with the telephone. Well, incidentally, mobile phones, you know, came into being and it was far easier to put up, you know, uh, cell towers and, and uh, you know, sort of signal amplifiers at the appropriate points. And then suddenly, uh, you know, everyone, you know, could buy a, a cell phone and have access to telephony in the way we, we know it now. And um, incidentally, uh, today, I think uh, there are roughly 8 billion, you know, smartphones or, you know, mobile phones in the world. And that's slightly less than the, the total population of the earth. And, you know, very soon, I think we'll have more, more mobile phones than, than people. So what happened? And that, all that happened in the last, you know, 25 you know, years, right? So in a very relatively short period of time, uh, everyone has phones and while uh, TikTok and Instagram and others are very, you know, delightfully entertaining. Uh, it means that for the last vast majority of the population, it's a means to improving the economic conditions, right? Because they now have access to information, you have access to education, you have access to, to, to jobs and earning a living, you know, using your phone. Uh, so that's like technology put to use and, um, you know, improving the lives of people around the world. And so similarly, I think AI and, and um, analytics and insights and, and sort of digitizing and virtualizing care have a similar potential. Uh, but, but this being health, it has to be done in a way that, uh, you know, accounts for uh, and very deliberately designs for all the things that could go wrong with it. So we know that today the system without AI and without technology is one that's not equitable. You know, the data is obvious in that, right? So all the factors that Maria just pointed out to and the outcomes that we see, if, if you're 
uh, an African-American mother uh, that's giving birth to a child, the mortality rate is far greater than, than otherwise. Uh, and then there's, there's, there's many, many, many other examples like that. So if we just take that system that has an inbuilt inequity in it and put technology on top of it and scale it, then likely the result of that would be that we'd be scaling the inequities in the system versus actually solving for the very things that we're looking to solve for. So I think we have to account for what's wrong in the current system, let technology play a role in, in, it, in fixing that problem through better insights, making more information available to our doctors and making um, information available more broadly and democratize it. Uh, but then use, use the, the scale of, of tech and internet speed uh, to get it more widely accessible. Uh, so that in the same way that, you know, smartphones are used to access economic information and uplift of, um, you know, our you know, finances and our, our lives, the same technology could be put to use to improve health. Uh, but we have to do it with a deliberate design in mind, accounting for the deficiencies of the current system and then offset it with, with technology and then scale it so that everyone, uh, everyone has equal access to it. And... That brings up a great point, which is when you think about scaling something like this, I would imagine both from your perspective, Maria, and from your perspective, Rajiv, you're looking to partner with entrepreneurial ventures that are lean and nimble and can help bring technology to the forefront. And then also larger corporate companies that maybe can help leverage the tech that they have from a communication standpoint to help offset inequity in social determinants of health, whether it's internet access or otherwise. Can you speak to a little bit about how you see some of those partnerships moving forward, uh, benefiting individuals of all <clears throat> equitable, all equitable standpoints, and then also where you where you think in the immediate future, large and small companies can partner appropriately to drive those adoptions. Yeah, you know, um, Maria, you've got a wealth of knowledge on this. <laughs> so uh, I, yeah. I'll frame it up, you know, so, so to us, it's, it, you know, it always, you know, the, the, the analogy of David versus Goliath, right? So it, it, to me, it's like, why is a versus, let's make it an end, you know, so we're a large enterprise, we move at a certain speed and, uh, you know, for good, bad uh, or indifferent, you know, there's, there's good, you know, there's, there's uh, benefits to that and there's disadvantages to that. So uh, our view, Alex, is that, uh, you know, as, as a, a company that uh, describes itself as a platform that connects the ecosystem and makes it available to our stakeholders, it means there are certain key things that we need to do. Um, but then really one of our core competencies at Anthem um, you know, um, with Maria's leadership while she was here, was to actually develop a, a systematic approach to integrating all the innovation that's happening outside of Anthem and connecting it and scaling it, making it available to our stakeholders. You know, and some of those innovations have to do with how do you make broadband more, more ubiquitously available? You know, how do you, how do you perhaps uh, compensate people with uh, cell phone minutes and data plans uh, to... Uh, you know, for health related needs, if they're making healthy choices, you know, um, making healthy meals for the for their families and whatnot. Lots of things like that, that that are that are happening across the country. But they're, they're in different sort of pockets, you know, pockets of excellence, pockets of greatness. Uh, but how do we systematically find all of those those innovations that are happening and connect it into a larger platform that, so that it's available to everyone? That's kind of like the mission around innovation at Anthem. Um, Maria, incidentally, was the one that uh, started it and was was a passionate advocate for it. You know, while she was here, and now she's part of a company called XY, as she mentioned, that's part of our ecosystem. So, Maria, would love to to get your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, well, having been on both sides of that question now, um, I'll I'll answer as the um, and as the Anthem Insider. And then I'll answer as the CEO of one of those small startups, partnering with other smaller startups or partnering with large companies like Anthem that are building an ecosystem. Actually, both in both cases, the key is to think about the end-to-end -end experience for the end user of what you're describing and what you're building. I'll tell you that on the XY AI side, we are currently working, we're basically serving up intelligence in a API so that the user could take our intelligence and put it into their own 
engagement app or digital therapeutic or clinical trial, digital trial they're running. On our side, for example, in that case, we only serve up, for example, what would be um, a high risk environment or high risk neighborhood, neighborhood for somebody who has income below a certain level and also has asthma and also has sleep apnea, right? So we would give you that intelligence as the user being a health plan or being a provider. But then if we only stopped at this point, if, if we only said you have access to our API, the rest of it is up to you, then we would be doomed to delivering an, uh, a, frankly, a, a product that doesn't live up to, the, to our clients' ex expectations. Because it's not, we shouldn't, as a startup, you shouldn't think about, I've got my little piece of the puzzle, it's somebody else's issue to figure out how it all connects with other partners. We now world, we live in a world where um, I frankly can't even think of a single product that, that is not depending on other partners for different features or different data dependencies. And so how do you play with others that are delivering or touching the same uh, end user is really important. And so the startups that I ended up working with very closely while I was at Anthem were the startups who were coming in with that end-to-end -end mindset. And it doesn't matter if it was a AI company or if it was a digital health delivery company on the clinical side, that these are the companies that really stood out. And now on the as a startup, as a leader of a startup, that's how I also try to anticipate what would our end clients need. And that's how I would reach out to other partners to help us on, on that front as we build capabilities. Great, thank you. Um, I think for some in the audience today, it would be interesting to spend a few moments learning about what it takes to influence the adoption of innovative technology, similar to what we were just discussing. But there's also a human story behind your passion to bring cutting edge technology into healthcare. And I think it would be great to hear for current and future leaders what that human story was and where you connected that really re-upped your investment in moving the healthcare ecosystem needle forward instead of stagnant, which is where it's sort of been for a long time. I mean, to me, I always go back to, um, you know, a AI and blockchain and quantum computing are great, but the patients really couldn't care less if we're using any of those sizzling technologies or if we're using pen and pencil to solve their issue. They want the app to work. They want to be able to get to their doctor's appointment. They want to be able to understand their bill when they get it. And they want to be able to feel that um, their healthcare team has their back. And at the end of the day, that's what really grounds me. I, I had the I would describe it as the privilege to be in the patient seat for about uh, 24 months as a, as a patient myself with a fairly rare diagnosis that required me to get very, very involved in um, the diagnosing and the treatment plan, plan for, my, uh, for my condition. And that really, to me, first of all, um, once I was on the other side, really triggered my transition to to Anthem because I wanted to be much closer to where some of these healthcare decisions were happening that were impact, impacting the lives of, of millions of patients. And so as leaders, um, we tend to get um, a little bit um, kind of caught up in the numbers, in the calls, in the projections, in the trajectories, in the future looking trends. And what has continuously grounded me is what's in it for the patient. And of course, with the recent pandemic, what's in it for the frontline providers? Um, anyone from the case manager who picks up the phone, who is making a call to that patient, to the, um, the doctors in the ED and the nurses there. So that's, I think, is, is what personally drives me, what uh, in many ways prompted the transition to XY, because I think um, in healthcare, the most difficult thing to do is to identify those missing pieces that actually pretty important in um, identifying health outcomes. Um, so I think everybody has their own personal why. And my advice is really daily, daily call, call back on your why. And it would, with that in mind, all the decisions are actually much easier. 
I think Maria, you were like a patient CEO before <laughs> you, know, you were an Anthem executive and then now a startup CEO. Uh, I think that's kind of, you know, one, one of our good friends, Robin, wrote, wrote a book called, uh, you know, patient you know, as a CEO of their own health. And that that's in fact, you know, what, what's necessary today. And hopefully that's something that, that we can change. Uh, and uh, Alex, to answer your question, my, my personal passion is what, what kind of brought me here was, you know, I was growing up, I was a huge fan of, of uh, uh, Star Trek. And, uh, you know, the, the you know, in, in, for an entirely different reason, my, my friends uh, had a nickname for me uh, called Bones because I was a skinny little kid, but it was Bones was the nickname of the doctor in, in the Star Trek series and was just endlessly fascinated by the tricorder and, and the sick bay and all of that. And it was just like a gleam in my eye to kind of bring some of those things to life in reality. And, um, and that's kind of what, what, you know, my personal passion is like, how do we bring, you know, tech you know, whether it's sensors and it's, it's more of the, the consumer facing tools or, or the things that are behind the scenes like AI and blockchain all together in a way that, um, you know, makes, makes, makes health better and, you know, kind of drives the consumer imagination and ultimate, ultimately inspires, you know, the, the next generation of students and others that want to be in this, this profession uh, to, to do the noble things that, that medicine calls, you know, um, you know doctors to go do. But then have the grant, the benefit of of great technology to be at their side, so that they can focus on the patient and make that patient experience and patient health outcomes, you know, the centerpiece of what they need to think about, versus all the clutter that currently surrounds the the doctor's offices today. And I think to both your points, um, one thing that UCLA Anderson really elevates is the importance of of healthcare as an integrated ecosystem. And so when you think about your teams that you build out, because many, many on the call today are thinking of their next career step, what do you look for in someone that's again, driving health equity, driving change, driving innovation as, as a well-rounded future leader of the world? And, and what advice would you give to them about thinking about their career broadly versus thinking about it in the finite next few steps? I love that question. Um, I will, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, after business school or after uh, college, I never expected that I would land in healthcare. And now that I'm here, I can't imagine doing anything else. And, and the, the reality is life has a, um, a funny way of putting the pieces together for you. And when you retrospectively look back, you're like, wow, it makes sense. I, I had um, uh, a tour of, I had, um, uh, I, I started my career in investment banking as a credit default swaps trader in London. Um, and I got firsthand uh, experience into what it means to make decisions at high stakes and what it means to, um, to make decisions at systemic level and what happens when the system um, gets it wrong. So having lived through the 2008, 2009 uh, subprime crisis really taught me a lot about the interconnected nature of large organizations and frankly, how to deal with um, situations where there is no playbook. The playbook was out the window once you know, you're seeing things happen that are truly unprecedented. And so even though if somebody says, well, what is an investment banker doing now being a patient advocate and a CEO of a health tech company? It, it really, um, all these experiences in, you, in your life um, in, enrich your curiosity and your mindset. So a couple of things that I would, I would point out to that has really um, guided me through my career. Number one, very early on, I, I learned that um, I work best when, when I work with people I respect and like. So I've actually followed people that I could learn from and people I respect. And that led me to multiple opportunities to learn and to grow with the leaders that I, I believed in. Uh, these were missionally uh, driven leaders who were building things that I could align on. I could really get excited about. The other piece is it has to do with your commitment to um, to staying curious and your commitment to doing the right thing and frankly finding out practically some of the blind spots in your 
in your own knowledge and actively seeking out to learn about them. Um, I don't think that in, in healthcare today, anyone can come in and say, I have a medical degree, I understand healthcare. It's so much more than that. We need to understand um, machine learning and data, and we need to understand how data turns into insights, and we need to understand what processes and the workflows drive healthcare and drive the, the humans and the clinicians in there. And more importantly, I would highly recommend everyone to understand the business of healthcare. Um, because at the end of the day, we are, um, even as startups or as patients, we need to understand um, what incentives, economic models are setting place and how that influences decisions and behaviors. And um, try to understand that without judgment, because frankly, and as being on the, on the start side now, it's great. Uh, startups, we have a great freedom to build almost from scratch. You have a white piece of paper and you could build it. You could design it the way you think is the right way to do it. Healthcare, US healthcare did not have that privilege, right? It is what we see today is a product of decades of building a pulse, building and decisions that were made under completely different circumstances. So understand the business of healthcare with a little bit of curiosity and less judgment. So, and, and that would really open up a lot of um, your decisions and a lot of, and would propel your career. Well, you know, what, what a lucky time to be a student. I, I think, um, the uh, you know the, the possibilities uh, of what's in front of us I think are um, very exciting. Uh, the the pace of change, uh, you know, is accelerating significantly, right? So it's very conceivable that that in our lifetimes that we'll have someone um, you know flying to Mars. Uh, you could do things like uh, you know task a satellite to do something you know uh, personal uh, for you, like what you know Maria's company actually does uh, today. So I, I think the immense set of possibilities, I think in some ways also create a conundrum, like what is it that you wanna do? You know, so, so I look at it as, uh, you know, you, you, you could be sort of a generally aware of multiple different disciplines. You know, whereas I think before, um, let's say a couple of decades ago, even 10 years ago, you have to specialize in one thing or the other. And I don't think, and well, of course, that's still viable. I don't think you need to specialize in any one thing anymore. I think you can be generally aware of multiple different disciplines, whether it's engineering or it's medicine or it's math or it's stats or whatever the, the underlying disciplines are. And then I think you can align what you want to do uh, to something that, that drives your passion. And, and that could become the, the vertical that, that you practice that takes care of, you know, your, your passion and your you know, financial needs and other things that, that are oriented around that. And, and that could change, you know, whereas, you know, before, I think if you practice in, in one, one area that you have to kind of stick to that. And now I think you can traverse, uh, you know, multiple different disciplines, jobs, companies, you know, it could be an entrepreneur, it could be you know, uh, working for a big company, it could, it could be a part-time worker in multiple different fields. All of those things are, are possible. Uh, and I think in some ways, because there's so many possibilities, you could get lost in what to do. And so having a design that says, you know, here's my horizontal, here's all the disciplines that I need to be good at to, to be generally smart and be a general athlete. And then I'm going to, you know, pick this passion area that aligns to, to what, you know, drives me every morning and kind of go orient my life around that. Is kind of how I think about it. It's like a T, the horizontal, which is all the disciplines that you just need to be generally aware of, and then an area of specialty that, that aligns to what you want to do. Very true. And don't and don't and don't get frustrated if you don't know what the 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 deep end of the T is yet. Um, sometimes that that comes with with experience, and it could change. Yeah, that's right. I think it's also particularly poignant coming from both of you with such illustrious careers to know that there have been moments of change and pivot between industry and areas of passion, even I presume. And yet here you are affecting change on one of the biggest systems in the world, which is healthcare. And it really touches and affects everybody. So it's really great to, and it's inspiring to hear. 
So okay. we have one more question and then we're gonna hopefully pull a few questions from the audience. But um, UCLA Anderson has a famous tagline that is think in the next. And as we begin to reflect on the two years prior and plan for a future state from your perspectives, what are some of the most influential technologies being piloted right now that we could leverage to build health equity and create that bi-directional relationship between those building the tech and those consuming it? I will, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'll take a stab. Um, I would actually uh, challenge us to think that in my opinion, technology in its most evolved form disappears. We, the experience for the user is so ubiquitous and easy and effortless that there is no change or no visible difference between as you switch platforms, as you switch te technologies or providers. And so if I look further out, I would see seamless interoperability and transitioning between different platforms, especially in healthcare. Um, if I try to look two years out, I think I'll see much more empowered consumers and much consumers that are much more aware of the value of their data and what they could do with it. And so I'm looking at some of the great uh, examples in the market, like uh, the blockchain uh, consortium between Anthem, other insurance companies, uh, providers and financial institutions called Avonir, looking to bring some of those um, use cases around interoper interoperability based on blockchain. However, these are not going to be only blockchain use cases. They are enabling on top of it to build other the solutions. It could be AI-enabled solutions. It could be solutions that are using meta and delivering virtual care, not only digital care in the virtual world. So in my view, um, the big wins are going to be those technologies that are focusing on that seamless integrated experience. And I, I'll tee that up to Rajiv because I want him to tell us a little bit more about that platform that stitches them together. Um, but that's where I would start. What do you think, Rajiv? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, uh, definitely a uh, uh, worthy, uh, I think, place to start. I, I think the, I, I, let's just say the abstraction of all of this, I think this is what's happening with Web3. Uh, I think if, if you look at sort of the, evolution of the web. Uh, I think 1.0 was, was like, a, you know, take what's currently available and kind of make it uh, available in a read-only form so users can, can browse uh, ubiquitously. You know, 2.0 in some ways was essentially the, the social media web, right? So it was interactive and users can create content and, um, and for good or bad, you know, that, that, that uh, it's a more centralized architecture, you know, that, uh, that, that dictates how that, that's all done. Uh, so therefore, there's a few big companies that, that control a lot of what happens on the web today. And then, you know, what we're working on now really is a, a blockchain-based, you know, architecture for the web, which makes everything more decentralized. And, you know, clearly what we're seeing with crypto and all, all, all that's happening there is, a, is an example of that. But, you know, beyond that, I think what it means is that um, the... Uh, the central orchestrators of the web could could be all of us. It becomes every single student that's part of UCLA and every every other person across the world could could be creating their own applications in a much more decentralized manner. Or you might say, okay, so what? I think the so what there is that then we don't have to to make choices around privacy and convenience, and don't have to give up our data to to some central entity that controls it and then profits from that. It's up to you, you know. It's up to all of us, you know, as to, to how our data gets used and you know what uh, what results from it. And it could be used with with deliberate design, where um, you know each of us could make choices on on what we want to share and you know who who benefits from that, and then in turn and in turn benefit directly from that. You know, so that I think shift is going to be very profound and has a lot of implications for health in particular because you know. You know, while we may be okay with sharing our pictures and whatnot, you know, with, uh, with, with others, you know, publicly, you know, health information is something that's much more sensitive and personal. And uh, we want to take the appropriate, you know, put the appropriate safeguards around it in order to be able to do it respectfully and in a way that doesn't compromise anyone's privacy. 
so so with that happening, I think it it then naturally sort of uh, you know dovetails into you know equity, and um, you know equity you know essentially you know comes with creating great solutions and being able to scale it and making it available to anyone that uh, to access it versus people with just the means to access it. So that's I think where this is all headed, which is if if you build on sort of a, a a brand new decentralized architecture for the web, and then you address some of the inequity issues that are inherent in the existing physical world and takes lessons from it and, and virtualize and digitize in a way that could be made available and then democratize the access in a way that's you know convenient, affordable and and um, widely available. You know, then I think we've got the makings of a system that you know five ten years from now is going to look very different than than what it does today. Yeah, I love that you brought it back to equity, Rajiv, because it. I believe that if we um, accomplish uh, the uh, the task of actually making healthcare more accessible and more integrated, that bring gets us a long way in uh, solving some of the equity issues. And at the end of the day, when we started our conversation with what are the missing pieces that what are the non-clinical factors that, that determine health outcomes, the more we have the con- that conversation, the more we address those factors, the closer we get to equity, not even being a topic of discussion because everything we build should be with that in mind, equitable, accessible, integrated care as a foundational principle. In the meantime, we have some work to do, absolutely. But I I do believe that the fact that we are having a health conversation and we're having a conversation around how important it is to bring, let's say, uh, a meals for a a diabetic mother that these meals need to feed the whole family, not only the mom, because a mom would not just eat the meals herself. She would have to, she would give them to her children or choose um, her uh, the cheaper option for herself. And so we need to look at um, the non we need to look at the, the neighborhood, the environment. We need to look at, again, as I said, access to green spaces, access to playgrounds, the YMCA, the child care in that neighborhood, and then think about community health because that would have a lot of um, the answers for the equity question you've been asking, Alex. Thank you. I think we have one time for an, one a minute for an audience question. So um, one that came in is one of the challenges in the U.S. is the bend is bending the cost curve of healthcare cost. How can these tech advances help to bend that cost curve? Well, one over what period of time is always the question. In my opinion, we ha- you start with um, preventative care um, rather than episodic care. And preventative care is the investment in health that over a longer period of time would pay off in lower emergency room visits, lower number of episodes and across different conditions. And so we start with preventative care and there's a lot of solutions that AI and blockchain are helping us do some of these things, right? Are we nudging the patients who would benefit the most from being more active, getting their preventative care visits done, et cetera? There's also a whole uh, set of activities around lifestyle. Are we helping patients make the right choices about their, their health, about their life? Are we educating them about nutrition? Are we educating them about stress management? You could call this preventative care, but if, it, if it's preventative care, it sounds a little bit punitive. No one wants to do things that are mandatory. If it's about lifestyle and how you're incorporating those healthy choices to be easy choices, to be um, enjoyable choices, then that becomes a lifestyle. And there's a lot of work with examples from virtual reality, metaverse, digital engagement that could help us with with that. For example, with XY, we're putting together a um, a program. It's soon to be public program for available for um, employers and health plans that would allow patients or users to go on a hike, frankly, get points for things like voting, get points for things like uh, going to the gym, going hunting, and then be able to then use those reward points for things that they care about. And there's a lot of um, 
a lot of other tools that technology brings to us that helps those inform those lifestyle choices. Um, so that's how we bend the cost curve. We don't, uh, we, yes, we could do things like um, remove uh, unnecessary processes in the system. And I think Rajiv and, and the team are really working hard on that. But that's where the, those two are the two things that I know I'm working very hard on. Yeah, and just maybe uh, one other point, Maria, to, to all the things that I think you you described that influence the cost and ultimately help us bend the curve, which is, you know, when you when you take something that's a physical resource, right, and, and digitize it, then uh, automatically, you know, the, there's a reduction in cost, right? So you know, imagine back to, you know, films, right? So uh, when, you, when you remove the, the chemicals and, and the paper out of it and you just took uh, pictures on your phone, well, and, and the cost of that picture is zero, you know, versus, you know, if you were to print, you know, something on, on a, a piece of paper uh, using chemicals and, you know, that costs some amount of money. So I think there's, there's a similar trend in, in health, which is, you know, once you start to digitize and virtualize a, a physical resource, then the cost of that resource, you know, starts to uh, behave more like technology costs, right? So with everything goes down over time where you get better performance, better cost uh, at a much, much, much more available, you know, sort of basis. Uh, and that's essentially what's happening with medicine as well. And, and over time, that, that's what's going to, you know, make healthcare, you know, cheaper and more, more widely accessible. Thank you both for generously sharing your time today. I know how busy you must both be because you're reshaping the landscape, but you're also, I think, inspiring all of us that are looking to the next stage of our career or trying to think very thoughtfully about healthcare equity and healthcare in general. And so everything you've shared today has been really empowering. And I speak for all of us on the Healthcare Business Association board when I say thank you truly for sharing your day, sharing your time. And we will keep you posted as to who goes where from UCLA Anderson. 